Good evening. Uh, my name is Alessio Patrano. I'm the director of the King's Japan program at King's College uh, London and a member of the Centre for Grand Strategy. And this evening, I am uh, delighted to welcome a good friend of war studies and certainly someone that I've had the pleasure to interact with and learn from uh, for a number of years. Uh, Bill Hayton um, is a person that needs very little introduction because he is, is, is renowned um, for his work starting quite a few years back now uh, with his first book on, on Vietnam um, and then with extremely successful um, The South China Sea, a book that in many ways uh, sort of paved the way for uh, or, or draw everybody's attention to a space that ever since the book came out has become central to the debate on, on East Asia and, and um, uh, international security. And today, I think we are here to, to celebrate um, another important uh, accomplishment, um, and that is engaging with what is a challenging conversation about China's relationship with uh, the South China Sea and how the South China Sea, in many respects, is, is a case study um, to explore how China's relationship with its immediate neighborhood, um, its place in international relations, um, is not as fixed as sometimes official sources would suggest, but rather it's something that changed um, over time. And um, also I'm particularly pleased because um, this is more than just a book launch, um, it is a bit of a conversation. Um, the format uh, will be, uh, Bill will, will, will present to us some threads that, that comes out of, of his book uh, for about 20, 25 minutes. Then we have a, a, a short conversation and open the floor um, for questions and answers. Um, and I'm particularly pleased to, to, to be able to host this event, partly because uh, for many of you who are in London um, and in the UK, lockdown is yet again upon us. Um, so uh, a very good way to um, uh, learn from the time that we have with ourselves is perhaps reading a book and, and these days having suggestions and recommendations of a good books and this one is one of those uh, definitely helps um, and that's that's one thing and the other thing is, is again because of the absolutely encyclopedic uh, knowledge uh, that Bill has gained over the years on the subject uh, but crucially, the fact that every single thing that, that he developed in the book, um, he spent a lot of time engaging with uh, pretty much everybody on the globe, putting out his, his, his ideas, having them tested and challenged. So the result is, is extremely rich and, and I couldn't recommend it more in that sense. So without any further ado, what I would like to do is to welcome a Bill um, and, 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 and give the floor to him uh, for uh, getting us into why should we buy your book, Bill. <laughs> Thank you very much. The usual 5% or less, you know. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm really pleased that uh, we're going to have this conversation because obviously we got to know each other uh, in the six years since the, the South China Sea book came out and we often talk about sea matters. Um, but you're also an expert on, on Japan studies. And we had, when we were talking about setting this up, I just thought, Given that I'm now looking at this other topic, you know, the, the, the importance of Japan in what I've called in my book title, The Invention of China, you know, it's, it's a deliberately kind of attention grabbing title. Academics might prefer that I use a word like construction of China. But my, my problem with that is, of course, construction of China sounds like civil engineering and I didn't want to be fired <laughs> on, on that shelf. So I've called it the invention of China. Um, but my meaning is the same. Um, and the more you know, I looked into this story and it, it comes from my work on the South China Sea. Um, and then I, you know, I realized that many of the questions about nation building, which when you look into the South China Sea, that's what it's about, um, you know, also applied to many other questions uh, that were happening within the borders of China as well. Um, so I, you know, I don't profess to be a China expert, but I've read an awful lot of people who are. And so what I've tried to do is kind of bring that work uh, to some kind of uh, accessible level for everybody. I've got a few slides which I'll show people. Um, and um, uh, we'll um, kind of count. So this is the book, you know, here's, here's, the, here's the plug. Um, and um, it's, uh, I, I cover a range of topics, you know, um, not just uh, questions of territory like South China Sea, but also the very idea of nation, history, uh, racial theory, language, and, and many other things which were crucial to this process of 
of uh, national, uh, you know, reimagining, I suppose, that you might say that took place at the end of the Qing. And, you know, I'm not claiming this is my own work. I've read an awful lot of, you know, very expert people, uh, some of whose books I've just put on the slide here, but use them as a, um, that's a shorthand for an awful lot more people that, that I've read. Um, and so if you're familiar with, you know, these books, maybe you won't learn a huge amount new today, but I think for a lot of people, uh, what I'm going to say is quite, um, quite new. Um, I mean, when we think about Japan and its role in the formation of Chinese nationalism, we kind of, I think there's a sort of assumption that they've always been oppositional. This is the image that comes to mind. Anti-Japanese protests, uh, the May the 4th movement in, in 1919, uh, when Japan was, you know, at the end of the First World War, was given the uh, Shandong territories, which had previously been occupied by Germany, rather than them being returned uh, to, to, to the Republic of China. Um, and this oppositional sense, and so, you know, Certainly in the 1920s, obviously in the 1930s with the war and, and later, we, we see uh, Japan and China as, as antagonistic um, and, uh, you know, as, as something to react against. But if you go back a couple of decades before, you realize just how important Japan was for the development of the ideas of Chinese nationalism. Um, and so, I, I, you know, I had, there is no specific chapter on Japan in my book, but it's a thread that appears, I think, in every single chapter, that Japan is absolutely crucial to the, to the nationalist transformation of China. Um, ideas of sovereignty, uh, race, history, nation, language and territory are all filtered uh, through Japan. Uh, often they were uh, echoes of de debates which had already taken place uh, in Japan um, and then were being translated into Chinese. And I'll talk a little bit about, about that. Um, so. I think you know you can see these ideas which you know landed in Japan being transmitted into into Chinese language and into into Chinese thinking, um, and then then given you know solid form in in the Republic of China and even in the People's Republic of China and even till today. So, I mean, when we we think about it, I mean, I, I'll, I mean, you know, just just a little bit of context in case people are not familiar with with the time scale. So you have Commodore, you know, the famous Commodore Perry and his uh, and his ships showing up in Japan in the 1850s. You get a, a new form of government uh, in, in the 1860s, in the late 1860s in Japan. Um, and then uh, from that, you get the first Sino-Japanese treaty and the picture on the slide is, is a picture of that treaty. Um, and, you know, which, you know, upends really the traditional or the, the Qing state. And I'm not really going to use the word China before 1912. I'm really going to talk about the Qing great state following uh, Tim Brooks idea of this great state, uh, Daguo, as being some uh, inner Asian uh, organization of the state. We can talk about that. If, if um, and, but it upends the idea that the Qing thought they were the center of the world and that Japan's role was to sort of pay tribute. Um, and then in, in, in 1871, you're, the, the two countries or the two governments are forced to have a, a treaty of mutual recognition. Um, you get the annexation of the Ryukyu, 1879, another crisis, the Sino-Japanese War, 1894-5, another crisis. But then very quickly after that, you, the, the Qing or Qing officials start sending students to Japan to learn from Japan's modernization. Um, uh, and then a lot of these reforming ideas are transmitted back into, into the Qing uh, great state. You have the reforms of 1898, which are suppressed, and that forces a great number of reformists to flee. People like Liang Zhichao end up in Yokohama where they start to just you know, soak up all the ideas that are swirling around Japan at the time. Um, things become more radical following the Boxer Rebellion and the international suppression in 1900, 1901. The revolutionaries start to take the lead. You get the formation of the Tongmenghui, the Revolutionary Alliance in Japan in 1905. And then six years later, you get the start of the, of the nationalist revolution. So you know, Japan, you know, partly because of its proximity, uh, but, because, but more because of its, uh, it, the fact that it played these, these, these different roles. And I would say that you know, three really critical roles that Japan played uh, in, the, in the invention of Chinese nationalism. It was a hammer. It smashed the old complacencies of the Qing, um, Qing state. Uh, it was a place of refuge where reformers and revolutionaries could find sanctuary. And it was a source of ideas which then um, poured into, the, into the, both the revolutionary and the reformist movements. Um, but perhaps, you know, the one, you know, 
one of the, the best places to begin is with this guy, Huang uh, Zunxian. So in 1877, uh, in the wake of that uh, Sino-Japanese uh, treaty, uh, Huang was one of the first uh, Qing diplomats to be posted uh, in Japan. Um, and he became a very active observer of what was going on in Japan, this, this rapid modernization, which he contrasted very favorably with uh, what he saw as the, the torpor and the decay of the, the, Qing, um, the Qing state back home. He just saw a country that was modernizing in so many ways. And he tries to alert the uh, Qing authorities, the, the fellow reformers, but also the, the, the bureaucracy of the state, you know, the need to change and reform and catch up with Japan. But he's basically ignored. Uh, he becomes a you know, well-known poet and, and a well-known reformer, um, but his efforts to try and get the Qing state to learn from Japan you know, really come to nothing uh, for, for quite a long time. Now, I think it's important to uh, talk about how ideas were getting into Japan as well. And I mean, this guy, Herbert Spencer, British uh, scientist, uh, biologist, and then sociologist, um, was absolutely uh, critical. Um, I mean, you know, although many people have no idea who he is these days, at the end of the 19th century, he was possibly the most famous European intellectual in the world, uh, really important in Japan, uh, influence in the US. And, he's, and he was the guy who invented social Darwinism, really. He was the one who talked about competition between individuals, but he then wanted to talk about the social effects and competition between groups and races. Um, but a lot of Japanese reformers, um, and there was the, the freedom and people's rights movement was very active in Japan. Um, they were very interested in, in Spencer's ideas of freedom and individual rights and competition and the need to basically break up, you know, shake up society um, and become, uh, you, know, uh, you know, get rid of feudalism, become a much more sort of enterprising capitalist society. So Spencer's influence in Japan uh, in this period, uh, in the sort of 1880s, 1890s, is absolutely cr critical. I think something like 32 of his books are translated into... Uh, or there were 32 editions translated into, Japan, into Japanese in the, in the 1880s, I think is the, the figure. Um, but the, of course, the, the, the shock that comes in 1894 uh, with, this, with the Sino-Japanese War really, I think, is the, uh, it's the, it's the beginning of the end of the, of the Qing state. Uh, you know, the Qing were sort of puffed up with their own abilities and they were dismissive towards the Japanese, calling them dwarfs and that sort of thing. And then the dwarfs basically kind of whooped their ass in 1894 5 in, in, a, in a walkover. Um, and, you know, suddenly I think that was the moment I think in which the, the reform movement galvanizes. And certainly you get, um, uh, you know, I think a lot of, you know, certainly a lot of foreign observers kind of thought that this defeat would be the, the wake up call for the Qing state, that finally it would realize the need to reform and modernize and so forth. Um, and the reformers took a lot of, you know, of their cues from that. Um, and then the idea, you know, the openings for ideas in the in the Qing court were, were really um, created, uh, allowing uh, reformers to get to meet the the emperor in 1898, which then led to the um, to the to what were called the Hundred Days Reforms, which you know you had you had 100 days more or less when the emperor said this is what we need to do to change, and then his aunt uh, organizes a coup against him, puts him under house arrest. The reforms are sort of squashed, and the, and the reformers have to go into exile. But it's remarkable that even you know, very quickly after that war and that defeat, uh, the Qing state start to send students to Japan to learn. Uh, this is from a, a few years later. This is from 1902, this picture. Um, and you know, there were, you know, schools were, you know, a school was created for uh, officials from, uh, from the Qing bureaucracy to come and learn from Japan. The first group was 13, I think, in 1896, if I remember rightly. Um, and then, but then over the years, over the next sort of you know, decade or so, you have you know, several thousand uh, uh, officials are sent to Japan to go and learn. And while they're there, they don't just uh, take on the, you know, the official curriculum, you know, they are meeting and talking with all the other uh, you know, officials and with the revolutionaries and the reform movement who are, who are in exile and learning a whole lot. And it kind of provides a place of refuge where the, the, the reform movement and the revolutionary movement builds up CADA, you know, builds up a big group of supporters uh, who were then going to go back in and, and transform China over the subsequent um, decade. 
so that's the sort of the refuge and the place of learning. But then you've also got a you know a process of of translation, literal, cultural, political translation going on. And this guy in the picture is Liang Jiechao, you know, known as the father of modern Chinese journalism. But I would also possibly, you know, I also claim that he was the person, the man who did more than anybody to invent or construct the Chinese nation by developing ideas about race, nation, history, and territory. And he was literally, you know, him and others were literally taking words from European languages, often filtered through Japanese, and giving them Chinese equivalents. Uh, in order to for these new concepts that were so important to nation building to have a place uh, in, in Chinese. So to kind of give one example, the Chinese word uh, Lingdu, uh, which means territory, was created and as a, it has the same characters as the Japanese word Ryodo, uh, excuse my pronunciations, um, and that word came into Japanese through Herbert Spencer. So Herbert Spencer writes a book in 1876 in talking about territorial issues. And then uh, Sadashiro Hamano translates Spencer and uses this word ryodo, literally governed land, to be an equivalent for the word territory. And then when Liang Chichao translates a Japanese novel, he copies the same uh, Japanese characters, the same kanji characters, with a, you know, once has a different Chinese pronunciation. Um, and that's the process. And then Hu Hanmin, who's a revolutionary, then adopts the, this term in his articles later which are talking about the importance of territory for the, um, you know, for, 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 the, for the nation to be able to assert its rights. So that, you know, here's a really simple case where you see an English word become a Japanese word become a Chinese word. And it wasn't just words that are being translated, it's the idea of territory and what that means, along with boundaries and uh, sovereignty and all those other questions. So you know, these are not uh, in, indigenous Chinese words, they are modern words, neologisms that come in from outside and Japan is absolutely critical in that process. And here's another example. So Liang Chichao, now dressed as a sort of, you know, modern Western gentleman on the right hand side, he's taking his ideas from a Swiss German political theorist, Johann Blunch, so Blunchley in German, his idea of Nation and Volk, they become translated through Japanese. And then again, and Liang Chichao invents words like Minzu to be the equivalent of, well, it's confusing because Blunt, when Blunchy said nation, he meant the English word people. And when he said folk, he meant the English word nation. So it's slightly confusing. But anyway, Liang Chichao takes his theory about nation and citizen and the difference between the two and ethnicity and minorities from Blunchy uh, via Japanese, another classic, you know, and, and we're still living you know, with the legacy of these arguments about what is a nation and stuff uh, you know, a century later. And, you know, another important figure, Chang Bin Lin, you know, you can see here he is dressed as a Japanese gentleman, you know, with, uh, you know, based there, he's a revolutionary, he opposes everything, you know, comes to oppose everything that Liang Chichao and the reformers stand for, becomes much more of a, a Han nationalist, you know, a racist even, um, and, but his ideas are also being formed uh, in exile, um, which then leads us to the formation of the, the Tong Meng Hui, the revolutionary movement actually formed in Japan uh, in 1905, and it becomes so. Japan becomes this uh, this you know febrile place where you not only have uh, you know Chinese revolutionaries and look at all the flags you see hanging on the roof there. You you know uh, Rebecca Carl has talked about this. You know you have you have Vietnamese, you have Phan Boy Chow, Vietnamese um, uh, nationalist, you have Filipino nationalists, you have people from all, you know, you have Hawaiian uh, independence activists are all kind of hanging around Yokohama and Tokyo, um, you know, swapping ideas, thinking of a sort of future, you know, pan-Asian revolutionary movement. Um, and of course that goes in, in different ways, you know, and you know, there's a strain of official Japanese thinking, which is, you know, leads us down the, the nasty road to the greater Asian co-prosperity sphere with a sort of, you know, a, a Japan-led uh, you know, neo-imperial formulation, but there's also an idea that there will be a, uh, you know, that this will be a new era of self-determination uh, for these uh, revolutionary movements, and there's going to be a nationalist, um, anti-colonial, uh, pan-Asianism as well. So this kind of decade, the 1900s in Japan, are absolutely, you know, critical for uh, a whole, you know, series of intellectual developments around uh, Eastern and, and Eastern Southeast Asia. Um, Zhu Wang, another student, um, you know, uh, wrote his uh, book, 
was, I mean, he was just 18 when he wrote The Revolutionary Army, quite a racist anti-Manchu tract, but quite a key uh, uh, publication in the history of the revolutionary movement. Um, and you can kind of see how these um, two strands, the sort of the reformist and the revolutionary, uh, the Han exclusivist versus the idea of a multi-ethnic state uh, after the revolution. Uh, here's a picture of Sun Yat-sen on the day of the uh, Ming Dynasty, the, the last emperor abdicates. And what's interesting, if you look at the, the two flags at the back there, you have the two uh, potential futures for China at this point. You have on the left a, a Han nationalist flag where the, the stars represent the uh, 18 provinces of the former Ming, a kind of idea of a Han exclusivist future. On the right, you have the, um, the flag of the five races or the five lineages, you know, showing a multi-ethnic future with the, the Han, the Manchu, the Mongol, the Tibetans and the, and the Muslims represented on the flag. And actually it was the reason that that became the flag on the right, the, the five, the five strike flag. The reason that the Republic of China became the Republic of five lineages with a multi-ethnic framework was because of compromises which had been reached with people who had been students uh, in, in Tokyo and in, in Japan who knew each other. And they were the ones that were able to broker a deal between the revolutionaries and the court administration, which ended up with a, a polyethnic uh, Republic of China rather than a a Han nationalist one, at least, you know, for the first decade or so. Anyway, that's a rather brief, uh, you know, kind of tour of the horizon. Uh, I know you know a lot more about Japanese history than I do, Alessio. So uh, feel free to ask me the difficult questions. Um, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for um, this, this initial overview. Uh, to be honest, I find it, it was fascinating, this, this, the way you put it. Uh, Japan is a hammer as a refuge and as, as a source of ideas. Um, I haven't thought about it that way, uh, but, but I think it's absolutely brilliant. And, and in many ways, it, what is fascinating is that it brings depth to what is an extremely dynamic period of history. Anything that really concerns the uh, Sino-Japanese relations, but broadly speaking, the history of, of East Asia uh, in between the second half of the 19th century and the first couple of decades of the 20th century, it's very fluid. And that's the, the amount of porosity and, and processing, what I would say is, is the broader phenomena of, of approaching modernity and, and modern concepts of, of states. Uh, that really yep. are being processed. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the impression I have from, from what you were saying really is that it kind of confirms more recent scholarship on, on, on Japanese history, that really one of the key differences between, between the way the sort of Qing um, and Empire and, and, and then the Tokugawa shogunates sort of reacts to this is that in Japan, what happens is that the revolutionaries actually win the day. Mm. Uh, because the major reformers, even though um, it is presented as a seamless transition, actually is all but a seamless transition. And it is really very much the ones that are coming with less baggage, if you want, that really want to engage with these new ideas and try to absorb them and process them in Japan that made that. And the thing that, 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 that strikes me is that, is it just an impression or is it also something that you came across that the the young Chinese uh, uh, men and, and women going to uh, Japan are exposed to the reality that, as you say, you know, it was, must have been mind-blowing for them. It must have been like, wow, right? Um, do you get a sense that, that, that there is that, that vibrancy? And at the moment that it's taking place, there is no, um, the tones are, are, are are not as, 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 as hard and as radical as they came to be later, but really there is this sense of like wanting to engage with these diverse ideas because they see that, particularly after the first sign of Japanese war, their country is crippled, you know, in a sense, and it needs mm. to be sort of reinvigorated and reinvented, as it were. Yeah, and I think in both countries, but separated by a couple of decades, there's this sense of crisis and a desire for new ideas that are going to a explain the crisis and b guide the the, the nation, the country, the state out of the crisis, um, and a sort of you know a search for something that's going to validate that uh, that I those set of ideas you know in the absence of God, for example, you know particularly, and so science and Darwin. Uh, is a pretty good way to sort of replace God. And so if Darwin says it's all about competition between, you know, individuals or groups, you know, then, you know, that's, that's what it's going to be. And, and look, we can, you know, 
that Darwin's competition between individualism gets mutated into an idea of competition being groups, and that goes into racial theory and yellow race versus white race and this sort of thing. And initial ideas, you know, certainly on the Chinese side, that they're going to appeal to Huang Zunxian, the guy I, I showed a picture of. You know, he's a big advocate of yellow race thinking that the yellows, the Chinese, the Mongols, the Japanese, everybody got to stick together to resist the white imperialists. Um, and that provides you know, kind of a way of thinking about the crisis uh, in Asia uh, you know, at that time and a way, way forward. Um, and it's only, I mean, that basically runs out of steam, uh, particularly after the Sino-Japanese War, when it's hard to pretend that everybody in the yellow race is on the same side anymore. And so that, and, and, and particularly, and then the, the Boxer Rebellion. Um, and that's then when you start to get Han nationalism, Han thinking uh, about it. Another set of ideas that will then go on to, to lead to the revolution. So yeah, there's a search for ideas, which you know I think is common to both. And I think you're absolutely right that at the time it's, it's very hard to, to, to suggest that, that there is that deeply ingrained perception that exists today that the relationship is a predominantly an antagonistic one. Um, because the, the, the permeability and, and in particular sort of uh, the, this idea of students going to Japan to study and then going back and do something um, in China, for China, um, it's actually very common. And uh, um, I, I think this, is, this comes across quite powerfully um, in, in the story you were telling. And then something that very often we tend to forget, um, that this idea of, of a place where you can sort of uh, be exposed to ideas and then go back and, 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 and sort of rethink about them in your own specific context, which, which leads me to another question that, that I wanted to ask you a little bit more about, this idea of territory. Right today, if there's if there's a thing that 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 if there's an aspect of uh, 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 the place where domestic and, in, and international relations sort of intersect when it comes to to the PRC in particular, it's the question of sovereignty and territory. And in the story you were uh, uh, explaining in the slides, you get a sense that there is a significant change in understanding the relationship between space. Uh, sovereignty and how the two that relationship contributes mm -hmm. to define the sense of, of, of national belonging. And I wondered if I could sort of tease you a little bit to, and, and sort of try to, to, to ask you to flesh a little bit more out about it, um, particularly if, if you gain any insights that would allow us to understand better that relationship, the relevance of, of, of these ideas to the type of phenomena that we're looking at today, whereby whether it is a land border or a maritime space, there is a sense of struggle and very much a sense um, of um, the centers of political power in China, putting an emphasis almost as if ascertaining territorial sovereignty is almost a way to reaffirm their uh, capabilities as, 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 as ruling, um, if you want, entities. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a number of different ways that kind of get us, get us into this. Um, I mean, the first thing is, you know, this, this idea of territory as a governed space with a hard line around it. And this, this is something that arises as a foreign idea. So, I mean, there had been um, uh, demarcations of boundaries between the, the Qing great states and its, in, its neighbors in places, um, but they were not... Uh, you know, it wasn't total, for example. So there had been the Treaty of Nechinsk, you know, back in the 1680s, uh, which was a boundary uh, agreement in effect between the Qing and the Russians. There had been a boundary agreement with the, with the Koreans, uh, helped by, in both cases, helped by the existence of a river, which made a, a clear line. But in many other cases, there was no, was no clear boundary. Uh, particularly when you had upland frontiers, you know, for example, on the frontier with, um, what, you know, what's now Vietnam, Basically, the upland areas were autonomous. They were kind of allowed to get on with their own life as long as they you know, respected the emperor's rule and, and that sort of thing. Um, and they were dangerous. They had malaria and all that kind of stuff. So nobody wanted to go there. So it just meant that the, the actual edges in many places were, were unknown. Um, and there's a, there's a good example, a good story I tell in the book, which is when uh, in 1934, uh, the uh, staff at the uh, Shenbao newspaper wanted to celebrate the uh, anniversary of the, uh, the revolution, I think, um, by producing a, a, a new modern atlas uh, of China, the first one that would have been made you know, since, the, since the revolution. 
and they and it I, I, the, the, the copy is um, is in is in the SOAS library actually, um, and in the preface they basically say they admit they say we sat down to make this atlas, but we you know we we consulted the best experts and they told us they didn't know where the borders were. Um, and so they actually, so because they, they, that's right, initially they were going to have an expedition to the borders to, uh, to celebrate this anniversary. And then they realized they didn't know where the borders were. And so therefore they, they turned the project into making an atlas to tell people where the borders were. But of course, the map that they come up with is a total work of fiction because it has this line around the Republic. But the line includes Tibet, which was independent in the 1930s. It includes you know, all of Mongolia, including what's now the independent state of Mongolia, also independent in the 1930s. Um, and it includes you know, Xinjiang, which was, you know, was under sort of warlord autonomous control. You know, but, it, you know, and, but interestingly, it doesn't include Taiwan because Taiwan mm -hmm. is gone. Um, but they had this idea that you know, they, were, they were kind of creating an idea of territory by the drawing and then having you know, kind of expeditions to go, go and map it. So, yeah, a very um, different idea, you know, kind of, you know, you know of, of frontier between the, the Qing state, you know, in most parts of the frontier and the modern state. Um, the other kind of thing to talk about is there's the, uh, the debate, you know, the, the crisis over the Ryukyu Islands, um, you know, because the Ryukyu had been paying tribute to both sides, from what I can understand, and, and was really enjoying being the middleman. In, in when, you know, when ch direct trade between you know, China and Japan was, was banned, the Ryukyu basically got in there, made a lot of money out of it. Um, and then when Japan annexes them, uh, you know, it creates a crisis. Um, but actually, the, from the Qing side, they admit that basically they're not making much money out of the Ryukyu trade. But what's important is the symbolic aspect that the Ryukyu pay tribute, and that makes the emperor center of the world. As it were, I'm kind of you know simplifying it quite a lot, and so actually they were more important, more interested in the symbolic nature of of Ryuku playing paying tribute, um, and so you know to cut a long story short, uh, Ulysses S. Grant, the the former U.S. president, gets involved in mediating between the two sides, uh, and in the end he basically he sort of suggests a partition that the you know the northern ones should go to Japan and the the, the southern two nearer to Taiwan should go to China, and the Qing just rejected out of hand. Um, and so they end up becoming Japanese by default at that point. And so that's when you another time when you see this real clash of worldviews between a Japan, which is interested in sovereignty and international law and, you know, modern Western ideas and a Qing state, which is still trying to cling to these old ideas of, of tributary relations. And, and it's fascinating in this sense, because um, you're absolutely right. There is also a question of... Uh, the complexity of introducing modern geography and and survey capacity, um, you know, the famous story that when the occupation authorities decided that they had to sort of to define the boundaries of the Japanese state itself, uh, they went around and they found there were at least four different surveys with four different results. Um, in terms of the number of islands that existed uh, in, in Japan. And, and, you know, the variation was by a few hundreds, uh, not just, uh, just, just a few uh, islands here and there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, and, and I guess, you know, that leads on, you know, to when in the north, you know, big, big issue nowadays, of course. Yeah. And, uh, absolutely. So, so this question of, of definition of territory um, and, 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 and sort of linking sovereignty to it um, really is something that is part of that struggle towards getting to grip with modernity. And, and, and I think it is very much true that, especially if you look at uh, the negotiations that take place from the time of the Ryukyu Islands, but down even to the Treaty of Shimonoseki and the first sign of Japanese war, there is a degree of clash between the two sides in terms of how they're mastering and how they're approaching the question of learning uh, the, um, 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 uh, this, this tools that are coming from, if you want, from, from a different part of the world, as it were. Now, we've got questions that are start sort of pouring in, and um, I want to give an opportunity to everybody to, to contribute to this. Um, the, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll start with a couple of questions that are um, uh, uh, dealing with a similar subject and um, in particular with the question of Herbert Spencer. And, 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 and I, I think you're not going to be surprised that, that in, in a time like the one we live in, uh, where there is a question of re-engaging with history and sort of holding accountable, if you want, different characters in history and their role in, in, in uh, um, all sorts of issues that we deal with today, um, a couple of questions are about Herbert Spencer, how it was introduced and to what extent in a way um, 
he found a fertile soil in the sense that that social Darwinistic component of his thinking and to what extent your impression as you were searching the, the, the book, to what extent, you know, how was it translated? Was it translated in a way that it played to anxieties that were already existing there? And um, how was it taught? Um, and in that sense, there's, there's another question related to this. Um, Herbert Spencer was essentially a tribalizer that contributed these ideological terms to the Chinese vocabulary. How might that reflect today? Is there a more than equivalent? And I think both questions actually are quite interesting. You know, how was it processed at the time? And whether it would extend to this idea of importing ideas from the outside, almost as a way to support a particular line of thinking, which is something that we all do in many respects. How do you see that then and now? Okay, I, this is going to test my knowledge of, the, <laughs> of Herbert Spencer's role in, in Japan. Um, I mean, I, I, if I remember rightly, and I, it's a while since I looked at this, if I, the president of Keio University, I think, was involved in the translation, and he was obviously quite a prestigious figure. And I think that gave Spencer quite a lot of you know, credibility uh, in Japan. Um, I mean, I... I guess, you know, if you were going, you know, if you were modernizing in Japan and you were looking for the latest in science, you know, Herbert Spencer would have been the person you, you know, you, would, you encountered. But quite whether it was Japanese students who were sent to Britain who encountered him or whether the books came to Japan with traders and, and diplomats and whatever, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, mm. So, I mean, I, I'm going to kind of, you know, fudge that one, I'm afraid. Um, but, you know, he was, you know, he was clearly eagerly um, uh, greeted, you know, his ideas when he got there, at least by a section of the population, you know, they were basically rich people who didn't want to pay too much tax. Um, and, um, uh, you know, people who were kind of, you know, opposed to, to feudalism, they were the ones that really bought into, you know, to Spencer, because he was kind of giving them the ideas for sort of, you know, survival of the fittest. And, and if I make a lot of money, then, you know, that's great. You know, you should encourage me. You shouldn't try to kind of tie me down with, with taxation. So there was a, di a distinctly libertarian take mm. on Spencer in Japan, which is actually quite different to the way that it was translated into Chinese. Because when the, the Chinese side, um, it's at, I mean, Huang Zunxian gets involved, but also um, a guy called Yan Fu, uh, who I don't think spent much time in Japan, but he was, um, came to the UK. He was a, a student of the Greenwich Royal Naval College. He was in the Navy. And he comes to, to London and he encounters uh, British thinking and, 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 and Herbert Spencer. And he translates, kind of translates, but also, you know, kind of mucks around with Spencer um, and takes the idea of struggle between individuals and turns it into a struggle between groups. And he's the one that kind of puts a racial spin really on Spencer when it comes to China, which isn't really there so much in the Japanese interpretations of Spencer. Well, I think he's still more of an individualistic figure. I'm, I have a, a related question to this, and then I'll, I'll go back to some of the questions that were asked earlier um, that, that really sort of uh, follows on on what you just finished saying um, about uh, whether to what extent um, you're engaging the book in the, in the um, um, uh, Japanese and, and, and Chinese nationalism in, contrast, in contrast to other races that Spencer would have depicted as backwards. And in particular, uh, Roger is asking about the example that comes to mind is the Taiwanese indigenous people that Japan inherited from, from China. Is there a sort of an impact, do you think, that this thinking about nationalism has? And I think you started to, to mention this a little bit when you talk about Han nationalism, right? And, and there's a struggle between sort of multi-ethnicity versus hyper-ethnicity or like a centralizing ethnicity. Um, do you get a sense that, that, that Spencer's ideas, in a way, contributed to polarise, um, if you want, that approach to diversity um, in terms of uh, ethnicity in, on, on both ends, or indeed in either? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting thought. Um, I mean, the, the racialization of the debate is there quite early on, I think. Um, and uh, becomes worse <laughs> kind of after 1900 really and it's uh, certainly on the on the side of the kind of the the, the, the revolutionaries uh, Han nationalism uh, becomes a way of 
bringing, creating a, a community of people who are going to be opposed to the ruling caste of the Qing, because the ruling caste of the Qing are ethnic Manchus, you know, by and by. The, 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 you know, the Qing was a Manchu empire at its, at its core. And so uh, the reformists were basically saying, we just need to change, we need to break down the barriers between Manchu and, and Han, um, and we'll all become, you know, kind of a big happy yellow race family kind of thing. Whereas the revolutionaries basically said, this is not gonna happen. The Manchu aren't gonna reform. We've got to get rid of the Manchu. And so that's, that's when they turn to Han nationalism. For some of them, it's literally get rid of them, expel them out of the Great Wall, sent back to Manchuria. You know, for others, it's, you know, genocide. And, you know, and there were, you know, nasty examples of that during the revolution. Um, so, yeah, but it has, as to how, I mean, to think about if I can think of anything to say <laughs> usefully about, um, about uh, the Japanese, when the Japanese occupied Taiwan, 1895. I mean, you, you do get a kind of, you get a, a sort of the, the, the if you like, the, the, the Qing loyalists on Taiwan, you know, try to declare themselves independent. Um, and then, you know, that, but that kind of fizzles out rather quickly, but you do get this resistance, which, which continues sort of up in the hills and things for, for quite a long time afterwards. Um, but uh, that's kind of, that was slightly outside, you know, where I, where I looked at in the book. So I'm not gonna say too much about that. Uh, Bile, here there's 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 a lot of excellent questions coming coming across, and and I, I really want to thank everybody who is um, typing their questions in because um, it, it really gives a sense of uh, um, the interest that that the discussion is stimulating, but the quality also and, and the commitment of the audience to to ask these questions. So so I'm very grateful to all of you, uh, Team Dean. Um, the there's two questions here that, that, that I think also sort of nicely come back uh, together. Uh, to take. Um, one is, um, you were talking in, in, in the presentation about the students going to Japan in the early 20th century and late 19th century. Who else do you think played a crucial role in this construction and mention of, of Chinese nationalism outside of their context? And, 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 and sort of like somewhat related to this, um, this question of um, uh, that you, you refer to quite regularly as, as part of sort of the, the, the idea of nation and, and citizen in modern sense, uh, in, in both in, in Japan and China, has been something that is um, imported from the outside and um, in that sense. Uh, but yeah. that run counter to some comments uh, from China, the, the idea of a nation stems from China itself. No, no, I, I think that, that what you said at the end is, is completely wrong. The, the, the really important people in the development of Chinese nationalism were not in China. They were outside and they were people. And I think it's critical that they were outside the country and they were looking back at it through the eyes of foreigners, if you like, or, or in, in the way that you would if you were in exile, because rather than being in the country surrounded by people who look and speak and act like you, and therefore you kind of think this is the world, all of a sudden, you know, Sun Yat-sen is in Hawaii you know, and he's educated by Anglican missionaries. Um, uh, Liang Chichao finds himself in Yokohama. Uh, Kang Yo Wei, you know, hides in different places around the British Empire. Uh, you have all those people who are in exile in Japan. Um, you also have people who are in the treaty ports, you know, in Hong Kong, in Shanghai, in Tianjin. And they're also surrounded by foreigners and looking at their country as something which is different. And so they create this idea and they kind of think, well, what is the essence of China? You know, kind of it's, you know, it's writing with characters. It's the emperor. Uh, it's, you know, the way we dress, the food we eat, da, 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 da. You know, this is what makes us special. And so it allows them to kind of construct an idea of a nation along a year, you know, at the same time, they're encountering all these European ideas. You know, people like Blunchley and Spencer and, and, and many, many others. And in that kind of, you know, melting pot, come or well, from that melting pot come the ideas that animate Chinese nationalism. So what I, my argument in the book is that when we look at China today, we see a hybrid. We see a fusion of ideas about China mixed with Western ideas, European ideas primarily, of what a country is, what a nation is, what a race is, all the rest of it. These were not categories or meanings or terms that were known to uh, Chinese people subjects of the Qing in the late 19th century. They were, they had to be constructed and then given to those people by the reformers and the revolutionaries, primarily in the 1900s. 
do you think, and I think part of the question was, do you think also that there is a certain sense of, 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 of recognition or denial vis-a-vis -vis this process today in China? Oh, I, I think it's completely denied. Mm. I mean, I, I think, you know, to, to some extent, I mean, the fact that, you know, because you know, Sun Yat-sen, of course, is seen as the, you know, the founding father of both the Republic and, you know, the People's Republic. And so if you look on sort of Chinese, you know, websites, you know, official China Daily or whatever, you know, history, you know, you'll have, you know, Sun Yat-sen was in Hawaii and in Hong Kong, and then he came back to the country and da 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 But the idea that actually uh, pretty much everybody was outside the country and that these ideas were innovations from outside, um, I, I think the, you know, the party, the Communist Party goes quite a long way to sort of downplay that narrative and to play up the authenticity. Um, one mm. interesting figure in this is that, uh, um, I was at the uh, Communist Party Museum in uh, at, uh, the former site of Peking University in, in Beijing a couple of years ago. And there was this kind of old bearded white guy kind of at the start of the expedition, exhibition, um, a guy called uh, Timothy Richard, a Baptist missionary from Wales, who might, to be honest, I'd never encountered before. But he's there at the start of the, this exhibition because he was the first person to use the names Karl Marx and, and, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, and Friedrich Engels in Chinese. And so he is acknowledged as being somebody who kind of brings, you know, Marx and Engels into China. Um, but, you know, the idea that the idea of a nation and, and race and all these things, that they're also foreign ideas, uh, I, I just don't see that. Wonderful. I mean, there's a, there's a couple of questions now, and um, I want to try and, and sort of cover them all. There's two questions that are slightly more on the contemporary side of, of the conversation, certainly sort of take the conversation more uh, towards the present. Um, one is, is a slightly more speculative, um, and, and it's about whether you think, based on uh, you know, your own intellectual journey into the discovery of, 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 of this idea of, of, of a constructed sense of, of nation, um, whether you think that that had Japan recovered from the economic bubble um, sooner and, and economic growth sort of come about uh, in a way that it hasn't for you know, the period of time known as the last decade, um, do you think it would have taken a similar sort of path uh, to China in terms of asserting a um, sense of, of, of national being and, uh, and as a result of that perhaps having a slight more sort of a, a, a contested uh, relationship with China, particularly on, on on matters of disputed territories. That's really interesting, isn't it? The, you know, could, you know, what could could Japan have gone? You know, because we, we think about the path that Japan went down in the twenties, thirties, forties, and we kind of assume that that was you know that was then and you know could never happen again. But you know, I guess you did have that crazy book you know written by an American author. You know, the coming war with Japan, kind of yes. you know, back in the was it the eighties or nineties. Um, it looks laughable now. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, you know, my encounters with Japan suggest that, that that's, you know, that there's no interest in that kind of, of nationalism. But of course, you know, we know that there are individuals who, uh, you know, who have a difficult relationship with the past and aren't prepared to admit certain bad things happened um, and, you know, would like to kind of make Japan great again. I guess those, they're there, but they never, they never gained traction. Right? Uh, or, or, or kind of majority traction. Um, whereas I suppose, um, you know, we're seeing a more assertive China at the moment. Um, and the nationalism is an important part of the, uh, of the, the message after Tiananmen Square in 1989. You know, the deliberate inculcation of patriotic education has been a part of the Communist Party's uh, legitimation strategy. Um, so, yeah, I mean, but then you know, I think you have an interesting question as to, you know, how much the average man or woman in China actually goes with this message, you know, or how much is just the kind of the, you know, the young men on, on you know, Weibo or whatever, the kind of the, you know, the netizens, the hotheads, um, uh, and how much of it is actually, you know, deeply felt. Um, it may well be that, you know, the proportions you know, of these kind of nationalistic minded people are similar on, on both sides of the, the East China Sea, but we just hear more and we focus more on the ones that are in, in, in China, for example. But it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. But do you think that the, um, the, the uh, Chinese current interests in, in the geopolitically disputed areas stem from more from, from historical uh, memory and the legacy 
of this long lasting debate over redefin redefining the boundaries of, 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 of national sovereign space? Um, or is it more due to uh, modern, uh, uh, um, if you want, questions such as um, economic advantages, you know, things like, for example, whether it's East China Sea or the South China Sea, there's, there's, there's multiple layers of the story, right? There is the, the resource elements related to boundary delimitation, but there is also the sovereignty uh, territorial control aspect that is much more about that sort of political dimension. Uh, to what extent sort of this journey of learning for the book uh, provides an insider to understand which one of these factors is, is, is probably more sort of influential or, or how do they relate each other? Is that like a, like a pendulum, right? They all matter, but at times <laughs> the, the narrative is more convenient in one direction than another. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, my impression on the Japanese side is that there's an interest in stability and rules and order, and so therefore, and, and therefore the status quo. Obviously, there's Japan would like to change things in the north, <laughs> uh, yeah. but you know, kind of when it comes to Senkaku, when it you know other things, they they want they, they want the situation to stay. They want, you know, and I guess they want the, the relative balance of power to 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 mm -hmm. remain. And therefore, they're reaching out to Vietnam and countries in Southeast Asia is part of a strategy of trying to keep things the same and trying to make sure that these 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 rules are are respected. Uh, for the you know for the foreseeable future, um, you know that, you know for my you know from the Chinese side, you know they would have been frankly on my view far better off if they hadn't been rocking the boat for the last decade. You know it, you know 2009 when Obama comes into office, they are in you know fantastic position. Um, everybody's kind of you know trading with China, loving it, all the rest of it, and then they start kind of waving the nationalist flag in the South China Sea. You know, and it gives the U.S. but I mean, it gives the Southeast Asians a reason to call the U.S. back in because they're worried, um, and you know, kind of everything, all of you know, the trouble that's happened since then has been because of you know missteps on the Chinese side, frankly. Um, and if they just basically sat tight, you know, left their ships at home and just waited for the U.S. to kind of you know gradually decline and you know and, and trade to kind of go in the Chinese direction. Um, you know, they could have achieved their aims with, you know, far greater ease and, and far less worry. Um, so the, I think, you know, for the, from the Chinese side, the nationalism actually is, is completely counterproductive. Um, one last question, because time now is coming to draw things to an end. Um, and there's a very, a, a very good question, something that I hadn't thought about it because I was carried away by the conversation, but, but, but it, it raises a very fair point. Um, you were talking about the impact that, that uh, ideas that are filtered through Japan and, and sort of go into China um, affect the, the, the way the thinking and these new ideas are coming about. To what extent there is also a direct line of contact um, uh, uh, with, with, with Western ideas and sort of Western Europe? Uh, we know that, for example, the Japanese were sending um, regularly students um, across Europe uh, to gain a direct exposure with some of these ideas. Um, what is the situation in China? Is there a sense of that, that they having their eyes systematic as the Japanese, particularly sort of the, during the sort of late Qing dynasty period? Um, and if not, is there a sense as to why they how they're making sort of their, 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 their decision about this? There were missions for sure, but the fact that we can almost name them shows you how few there were, yeah? Um, and there was a there was a there were haphazard attempts. So there was the Anson Burlingame, the American uh, you know mission uh, ambassador. You know he sort of took a group of people, Chinese Qing officials, to the U.S. and to Europe and so forth. Um, there was an attempt to take some young uh, Chinese kids uh, and put them in American schools. They would come back and form an embry you know embryonic you know kind of administrative uh, kind of cadre. Um, but the, you know, it, it was never systematic, and it, and it failed. You know, it, it didn't have much impact, particularly in a, in, a, in a much larger country. Japan, a small country, sent more people. Had they much had had greater impact? The real impact in terms of direct contact, I think, was probably the missionaries. Um, and so, people like uh, Timothy Richard, whom I mentioned, he was a member of it's this Christian, uh, the Christian Literary Christian Literature Society, um, which translated not just Christian literature but you know huge amounts of scientific stuff into Chinese. Um, uh, and other people, uh, what's his name, Fryer, who was uh, in Shanghai, uh, 
you know, uh, the Chinese scientific magazine. These, there was, you know, there was direct, uh, you know, transmission from Europeans into the Chinese language uh, through other ways as well. Wonderful. Um, I think, you know, we could carry on for a few extra hours, but that would be uh, totally unfair of me uh, to keep you hooked on this conversation. Um, but it's a fascinating journey. And, and there is a lot more in the book that takes the story uh, down to the present day. Um, and I'm, I'm extremely grateful that you took the time uh, to uh, join me this afternoon and everybody else um, listening at, um, at the other end of the uh, virtual room um, uh, today. Um, a couple of last sort of announcements before we say goodbye. Um, uh, we have a few other events lined up, a couple of other book uh, uh, um, uh, uh, launches. Uh, Tobias Harris uh, on the 18th of November will join us to talk about his book, The Iconoclast, uh, which is a first sort of biography um, of uh, Prime Minister Abe. And then on the 2nd of December, we're back on a conversation about the impact of the Japanese Empire and the transformation of East Asia with Jeremy Yellen at book launch on the Greater East Asia Core Prosperity Sphere, which was mentioned tonight. And then last, but by no means least, uh, we have Nadia Shadlow uh, for the Engelsberg Annual Lecture on International Order on the 8th of December, all organized under the umbrella of the Center um, for Grand Strategy um, and the King's Japan Program. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us tonight. Bill, thank you so much for your time. Um, best of luck with the book. And I'm looking forward to the next one, really. <laughs> <laughs> You're only as good as your last book. <laughs> <laughs>